Hello and welcome to Prescott Talks, brought to you by Prescott E! News. I'm your host, Brooks Compton. And today, our special guest is City Councilwoman Kathy Rusing. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, Kathy, many voters already know you because you've been sitting on the, the council for a while. But for those who are new to Prescott, can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, who you are? Okay, thank you. Well, I'm currently a sitting uh, city council uh, member. I was elected in 2019 mm -hmm. to a four-year term. And so now I'm running for my second four-year term. And I need to have a little disclaimer here. Uh, I am speaking just for myself. And as a council member, I'm not speaking for the rest of the council or the mayor. These are just my own opinions and thoughts. Okay, well. I want to get that out. Understood. And yeah. uh, when you were out gathering signatures this year, it was a, a little different. We had weather, winter oh, weather. Yeah. How did you go about getting yeah. 1,500 <laughs> signatures? Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that this election cycle was actually 30 days shorter than it has been in the past, thanks to the state legislature. So they shaved off 30 days. And so we had 30 days less time to collect even more signatures because it's based on how many votes were cast in the last mayoral election. So we had to get at least a thousand signatures. So the weather was unbelievable. We had events canceled. We had snow, ice, blizzard conditions. But you know what? I got out there and I met the people. I was standing out there at the courthouse plaza. I was at the post office. I think many people will remember me with my clipboard. Mm -hmm. And at the adult center, the library, the library was great. And I also was out there with the other candidates. You know, I didn't really know them, but we developed a camaraderie. You know, we'd have our tables kind of together to get the people. And I was really impressed at how hard they worked and how dedicated and how committed they were. And I think that translates over to how you're going to be as a council member. And it also gave you an opportunity to meet the voters. You know, everyone's out there walking their dog around the uh, courthouse plaza. So um, we did not use uh, paid circulators. And so I you think, actually met right, the voters, we got met the, the voters, And we were out there and, you know, it would take about an hour to get 10 signatures. So if you do the math, I mean, we were very, very committed. But uh, let me back up a little bit. I just wanted to say a little bit about myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I was uh, born at uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital, delivered by a corporal. My really? dad was career military. Okay. So I am an official uh, Air Force brat. Okay. And I've uh, lived in Arizona since uh, 1965. I went to the University of Arizona, got my nursing degree and worked cardiopulmonary for 10 years. And then uh, I met my husband. He's a general surgeon and we chose to come back to Prescott, even though he was not born here, but raised here locally, went to school. There's four generations of Rusings here in Prescott. But we chose to come back to Prescott because we felt it would be a great place to raise a family and uh, serve the community. We could have gone to many more places and made a lot more money, but you know, that wasn't important to us. It was all about the quality of life here in Prescott and being close to our family. Because my parents also retired here and had a house on Park Avenue. Oh, really? So after um, 30 some odd years of a very busy, successful surgical practice where uh, I helped uh, manage it. Um, he retired and he straight away got involved in Save the Dells because he's a very active person and started serving the community that way. And I, by watching what he was going through with Save the Dells, I said, you know, there is such a disconnect between the city council and what the people want. Well, that brings up a good yeah. point. When you were meeting uh, the voters, getting your signatures, mm -hmm. um, what should the candidate, what should the voters be doing to vet the candidates? Well, that's, Was that happening? That is, that's a very good question. And if you're a voter, you need to ask the candidate, even though it's a nonpartisan election, you know, it's good to know, you know, what, what's your political party? And how long have you been in Prescott? Have you been in Prescott full time or just part time? And where do you stand on the issues of water, 
growth and development, traffic, uh, open space, preservation of our natural beauty and our quality of life. And also lately, public safety has become a big issue too because unbelievably, we have not had a new fire station in 30 years and we haven't even remodeled one. Mm-hmm. So it took this, it took Mayor Phil Good and the rest of the council and a new fire chief, Holger Dura, to tackle this issue and say, you know what, we need to manage our growth in such a way that the infrastructure is not um, left behind. So if I'm understanding you correctly, your campaign is about issues and your accomplishments. And and my record. And your record. And so I have uh, just a few things here. Uh, First of all, as you know, water manages growth. And we had a prior water policy that was passed actually in 2019, five minutes before I was sworn on to council. (laughs) Five minutes. Yeah, about five minutes. And it was very pro-growth and pro-developer. Okay, so we had a huge surge in projects. Stringsfield Ranch was one that uh, even though it's in the county, it has city water and sewer. And we, when Mayor Phil Good got elected, he worked with city staff and with council and we crafted and passed a new water policy with within you know a couple of months because it was that critical and it has several elements if we're going to grow we're going to grow by annexation and not run water uh, causing urban sprawl out in the county Uh, we have a water budget now and we also uh, are not going to form water improvement districts with developers and private properties only with other governmental agencies so those are three key elements and unfortunately, our water policy can be um, uh, uh, not passed. You know, it took only took four b- votes and we passed it with five. There were two dissenting votes. But if we don't maintain a majority in council that believes in well-managed, well-planned growth, growth that doesn't outstrip our fire police and infrastructure, then that water policy can be uh, removed in with just four votes. So I would like to maybe see some of these elements in the future incorporated in our city charter and let the voters vote on whether or not we should wa- run water outside. The so city during limits. this campaign, it's especially important to have like-minded people on yeah. the council yeah. to deal with our water issues. Yeah. And it, you know, it's not. You know, you don't want people that are going to agree 100% on everything, but you need watchdogs. You need people that are elected officials that are going to listen to you, the people, that believe in the concept of we, the people. And I believe that council policy should be driven by you, the taxpayer, the voter, the person that lives here in Prescott, and that uh, special interest groups such as our developers they need to do more negotiations. Unfortunately, we have several development agreements that are so one-sided and pro, pro-growth, pro pro-development, and favor the developer that we're locked into those agreements. So I just want to give people warning that they're legal documents and you know we have to we have to live up to them. So some of the things that we may be seeing in the near future, you mm-hmm. wouldn't be in favor yes. of, but we're the city right. is locked into Legally, it. Legally, we have to do it. Um, an example is Deepwell Ranch. Uh, we have a very, uh, uh, it was a development agreement that was very favorable to the developer and the city did not negotiate uh, hard enough. And as a result, we did not protect the airport uh, crash zones like we should have. Originally, uh, the crash zones were uh, uh, in zoned like, for example, industrial light and not allowing a residential at the end of the runway. And it's also, you don't want a residential under a very busy uh, flight path where you have a lot of flight So display areas. The display, right. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately with the uh, development agreement and the master plan and the annexation, everything was rezoned SPC, specially planned community, which is kind of a catch all. It means basically they can do anything they want And nobody realized that if you don't have a code or a zone that prevents developers from putting churches and schools in the crash zone, 
you don't have a leg to stand on legally. You know, morally, it's not right, but they can go to court and get a judge to say, you know, and sue you. So we, that's why we tried to get the ABO passed. Well, let's, let's get into that topic about yeah. the airport. Why is the airport important to Prescott? And what mm -hmm. are your views on yeah. the ABO? Yeah. Well, um, as you know, Prescott is the economic driver for all of Yavapai County. And Yavapai County is the fourth most populous uh, county in the state. A lot of people don't realize it. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we have uh, the only uh, municipal airport that has commercial jet service. Nobody else in the county. We fly to Denver and we fly to LA. And those are great connecting hubs. So uh, we also have a, a national, internationally known uh, flight aeronautical school, Emory Riddle Aeronautical mm -hmm. University. And they have invested a lot of money into their training programs. And they're now building, planning on building a facility there at our airport. And we also are important, we have the US uh, Forest Service, the fire center is out there too. And it's very important because as you know, we have a drought, we're surrounded by the forest, mm -hmm. and yes. uh, forest fire is always a danger. And 21 years ago, we had the Indian fire, where it was so, I had to evacuate because I lived up off Copper Basin at the time. And we had the slurry bombers stationed here, and it was critical. They flew over constantly, dropping their loads. And that's why it's important that we keep an airport here. It's a huge economic driver for the community, but we need to protect it from encroachment. It's all about public safety, mm -hmm. public safety for people in the air, because we need to have a runway extension so our commercial flights can fly out uh, fully loaded mm -hmm. with because we're hot and high here. And also the slurry bombers. You don't want a slurry bomber uh, fighting a fire with only uh, half a load of slurry. Well, in terms of uh, public input in, in topics such as this, where what are your views on the public transparency within city yes. council and public mm -hmm. input when it comes yeah. to city council. You know, that is is so important. You can never have enough transparency and public input in uh, in your local government because, you know, it's your local city council that has the most influence on your daily life. A lot of people don't realize that. And as a result, since we're local, we should be the most accessible and we should be the most open and transparent. And one of the things that uh, Phil Good did and he brought back was the call of the public and the city council supported it. It's at the very beginning of every meeting, you get three minutes or longer if needed. And anybody, it's not on the agenda, like say, you know, you had a water main break and you wanna come down and tell us about it and it flooded your house or there's a problem or maybe something good's going on. And you can come down and let us know, you can speak for three minutes and then if it's something that we feel we can help, then we can instruct staff. We can't answer you because it's not on an agenda item and hasn't been properly noticed, but we can instruct staff to look into it and see if there's something we can do to okay. help you out. And then also mm -hmm. we're encouraging more study sessions. You know, back in the olden days, we used to have an executive session on some huge critical, critical uh, issue and then go immediately and vote on it, you know, at our voting session without any uh, public input. So uh, we're definitely getting a lot more public input. If there's something affecting a neighborhood, then I'll just give the HOA a call or one of the neighbors and say, hey, did you know they're planning on putting a cell tower in your backyard? Or, mm -hmm. hey, did you have any input? You know, we're planning on, we're gonna be talking about this 500 unit subdivision going in on your neighborhood. Did you know anything about it? And the HOA is like, no, we didn't know anything about it. And apparently okay. the city staff doesn't have to notify them. You know, it's, it's kind of strange. So there's nothing wrong with just reaching out to people and saying, hey, would you be interested in coming down and speaking for a few minutes, maybe bringing a few of your friends, because this is going to really impact your life. And a lot of people, they have no idea, you know, what we're what we're doing. So well, what's get the, involved. What is the public input in terms of uh, naming buildings, for example, oh, City Hall? I'm just that's, that's curious. Yeah, people that's, are curious about that. Yeah, we didn't have a policy in the past for naming uh, public buildings, and as a result, um, any uh, anybody could uh, name one of their buddies. It was usually a, po a politician, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. They'd have their fellow, uh, you know, politicians uh, say, hey, we're going to name a city building after you, you know, some uh, city something. And, you know, that's not right. And 
because what would happen is the person wouldn't be retired. They'd go on and run for another uh, public office and yet they'd have this huge uh, government taxpayer funded building with their name on it okay. as they're campaigning, you know. So uh, what we did, um, I kind of spearheaded it and we came up with some criteria. And if you want to have a building named after yourself, number one, you have to have done something extraordinary and above uh, the average. Okay. Know? And then number two, you have to be retired or uh, passed away. So that you're not going to be running for another another office. And, you know, we have to get the family's permission. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, have a public input where people can come and say, hey, I think this is a great idea. Like, for example, the process to name uh, No Name Creek, Elizabeth Creek after Elizabeth Ruffner. Okay. That was wonderful to see the process uh, working the way it was meant to be. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, if the uh, public wants to get a hold of you or is interested in your yes. campaign, where can yeah. they, how can they reach yeah. out to you? Where can they find you? Yeah. Well, I have a website. It's kathyrusing.com. And uh, it also has a donor button. You're certainly welcome to hit the donor button because, as you know, a campaigns can be very expensive. We're buying a lot of radio ads and newspaper ads to get the word out. And then you can also reach me on uh, Facebook, Kathy Rusing for Prescott City Council, and then email electkathyrusing at gmail.com. Kathy, thank you for uh, being a guest on Prescott E-News oh, and Prescott thank Talks. You. Yeah. And to all the voters out there, thank you for watching. <laughs>